Thank you, Governor Ricketts. Uh, it was a real pleasure and an honor meeting you a couple of years ago as part of one of our ALEC regional academies. Uh, your, your leadership at that time was evident. Your leadership throughout the coronavirus uh, crisis has been apparent. And your continued leadership on taxes, government spending, and right size regulation are definitely a model uh, for other governors to follow. I hope they're taking note of how well Nebraska's weathering this crisis and the things that they can do to, uh, to put into practice many of the actions you have, which are helping your state move forward in a, in a very good way, considering all the challenges. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here with all of you here today as a long time and uh, now recovering legislator, former Speaker of the Missouri House from 2012 to 2015. I know that delivering on promises that we make every day, uh, every cycle, every uh, session as legislators and leaders is fundamental to managing and growing our states. In this time of COVID-19, we must redouble those efforts to ensure we remain focused on fiscal responsibility while facilitating society's return to normal. We will return to, return to normal days and we must not uh, forget that along the way, despite whatever edicts continue to come down from Washington, D.C. Before I introduce our very illustrious panel we have for you today, I want you to all know that our panelists will take questions from all of you following their opening remarks. All you need to do uh, for questions is to type them out into the chat box, which we've all become very familiar with during these Zoom times. When we get into the Q&A section, I will select from the submitted questions and will answer them as many as time allows for this session. As Lisa remarked before, the efforts of the Save Our Country Coalition to reopen American society and get America back to work have been imperative in the response to COVID-19. The ranking of governors shows how our states with already good economies like Nebraska responded to COVID-19 with the same commitment to fiscal responsibility and to limited government. I can tell you that uh, that coalition is extremely important. There's a, a daily newsletter that the Committee to Unleash Prosperity, which is related to that effort, puts out every single day. I use it every single day. I urge all of you to sign up for it. Uh, in addition, ALEC has been at the forefront of this coalition as well. If you go to alec.org right now, you can see right there on the front page the opportunity to sign up to uh, as many as over 200 legislators and over 1,500 state leaders already have to tell the feds that the states need no further bailouts. So today, joining Governor Ricketts to discuss all of that and more on the panel is the esteemed Dr. Arthur B. Laffer. Dr. Laffer is a longtime steward and ALEC scholar that we all know extremely well, creator of the ALEC curve, the famous ALEC curve, the former chief economist for the Office of Management and Budget, and the 2019 Presidential Medal of Freedom recipient. We were all extremely pleased to see that. He, along with Steve Moore, Travis Brown, who's the CEO of my company, the First World Media Network, and Rex Singfield are co-authors of An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of States, a volume that I know many of you have on your bookshelves. If you don't, you need to get it. Co-author Steve Moore serves on the ALEC Private Enterprise Advisory Council. He's a former member of the Wall Street Journal editorial board. Today, representing, as I mentioned, the Save Our Country Coalition, he has called for all states, red and blue, to take competitiveness seriously by cutting excessive taxes and spending, not adding to the fiscal crisis and challenges we already find ourselves in. Finally, the principal researcher for the forthcoming Laffer Alec Report on Economic Freedom. Ms. Donna Karanen previously served as finance director for the state of California. She is a leader, nationally known leader, in budget management and tax policy who believes that sticking with economic and fiscal policies that may be difficult in the short term will have long term beneficial effects. Before we get to that panel, I want to show you a quick video highlight of many of these efforts. America and destiny, two words that have always stood side by side. We face revolution, civil war, world wars, enemies in uniform, and enemies with no nation, invisible to the naked eye. And 
through it all, from the promise of the fabled city upon a hill to the long arc of history that bends towards justice. America's fate was never certain. It was our destiny to prevail over adversity through sheer will. What were they thinking? What did they fear? Did they know they'd win? There is no force more potent, more strident, or more resilient than the willingness of Americans to simply try, to endeavor to accomplish something that's never been done, that seems too difficult or is deemed impossible. But those who dare are the only ones who can win. We go forward, like we always have, to make lives worth living. We hope you'll join us. Go to lifeisforliving.org and tell us how you're moving forward. Oh, okay. oh, okay. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Uh, great, uh, to, be great to be with everyone, and, uh, and it's a pleasure to be with Arthur and Donna and, and Governor. You're amazing. Yeah, I, I think, Steve, let me, I, why don't I start on that, and I'm going to introduce you yeah. and Donna. Sorry, I thought Tim was going to introduce me here on that, but boy, what a great job Tim has done in the state of Missouri, and what a great job he's done with the firm as well, with Travis and Kelly Brown and Rex Seafield and that whole team. What a great job, Tim, you've done. Uh, phenomenal. And Pete Ricketts, I mean, Amazing. There's one thing Pete Ricketts needs to do, though, by the way. He is one in the governor of one of the 11 states that introduced the income tax in the last, uh, since 1960. So we're looking to you, Pete, if you're still listening, get rid of that income tax. Nebraska forever. That'll be great. Uh, we are doing <laughs> for Alec, which is just wonderful. The project is sponsored by Jim Don Darrow and the Dallas Foundation. It is to rank all the governors and Thank God you had Pete Ricketts on here, Lisa. Otherwise, it could have been embarrassing, but uh, he's done a great job. Uh, but uh, that ranking is going to be ranking all the governors. The two primary rankers here are by two dear, dear friends. Uh, I'm going to introduce Donna Ardwin first. Uh, she is looking at, she, by the way, was the, was the uh, first year's budget director for John Engler, first year's budget director for Pataki in, uh, in uh, New York, First year budget director for Jeb Bush, uh, that was in Florida. First year budget director for Arnold Schwarzenegger in California. And first year's budget director for Dunleavy in Alaska. She knows her numbers backwards and forwards. And with that, I'm going to let uh, Donna start the process by telling us what she's been doing on ranking of the governors. Thanks, Donna. <laughs> Thank you, Arthur. So uh, my portion of ranking of the governors is their recent fiscal policies. We have a slide. Thanks. So we are ranking the governors on their recent fiscal policies, including their pre-COVID policies. As Governor Rickett said, some states were prepared and some weren't. I always advise my governors that you have to be prepared for some unknown exogenous crisis or disruption because they always come. And some governors were prepared for it and some weren't. So we're looking back to see what the policies were proposed um, pre-COVID. Um, this is just a sample of some of the governor's fiscal policies, if you can see on the slide. Um, we're looking in depth um, using the experience that Arthur and Steve and I have had with governors over decades um, and the in-depth databases that we've kept. We know which policies matter ultimately to a state's budget and which policies ultimately matter to a state's economy. And so this is just a sampling. But when we say limiting spending, for example, we don't just mean if you're in New York, we didn't spend a whole lot more than last year. As Governor Rickett says, there's a difference. And I worked there and I worked in Florida. That might be meaningful for Florida, but it's not meaningful for New York. Meaningful spending allows an economy to grow. Meaningful spending restrictions. Um, just to hit on another one, tax policy. 
Um, we've all learned from Arthur that all, not all taxes are the same. And if your tax policy is true, good, laffer tax policy, like um, lowering rates, broadening basis, that's meaningful. But we're not going to check a box and say, you know, you added another exemption to a tax and there you, or you lowered your marginal burden. Um, so we're going very in depth on those. Um, reserves, Governor Ricketts talked about those, the meaningfulness of having those available and not kicking the can down the road, especially in times like with the COVID crisis. Um, there's numerous other things that are important, still important, union policies, welfare, including Medicaid policy. Medicaid doesn't just happen to us. We don't, you know, we can't, they're not expenditures that we can't control. And truly, you know, controlling how many people are ultimately dependent upon governments. Next slide. The next slide just shows the cover of, uh, hopefully you're all familiar with Rich States, Poor States, um, the publication that Arthur and Steve write with Alec every year. And it shows which variables, again, really make sense, make a difference for states' economies and ultimately their budgets. And by the way, states' budgets affect their economies and the economies affect budgets, so they go hand in hand. Um, we know which variables matter, and we're going to be digging into all of those into this in this report. The next slide. We're also looking at the prospects for the future of governors. So it's not just what policies did you propose, but what are those things that you've carried through and are really, really pushing hard for? So we talked about meaningful spending uh, tax controls. Um, some of those things are, you know, budget wonky, like estimating conferences. But there are things like performance budgeting. Governor Ricketts talked about his Lean Six Sigma. Um, uh, performance contracting, performance contracting, not only with the universities, but with your agencies, um, school choice programs. So there's a number of things can, that can institutionalize good spending controls. And now this year, of course, there's how did you respond to this crisis? First, the budgetary way. You know, what are you using the CARES Act money for, as, as the governor described? You know, are you using it to support ongoing programs that you're not going to be able to afford? Or did you use it to try to retool your economy and get it moving again? Um, what um, actions are being taken? You know, are you calling your legislatures back to reduce budgets? Because like it or not, you know, if you retool your economy quickly and your COVID response was positive as the experience in Nebraska, then you're going to have a, a smaller disruption, but you still probably are going to need to cut your budgets on a recurring basis. And then finally, and Steve's our national expert on this, how did you respond to the COVID crisis um, economically? Because again, that's going to affect your budget and budgets for years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donna. It's really great. By the way, just so you know, this is a, you know, these old oldies but goodies people getting together from years ago. There used to be a firm back long ago, right after you left California, you formed something called Arduin, Laffer, and Moore. And we've got the three oldies but goodies coming back again. Donna, you did a great job. Uh, it's so much fun. And of course, the premier, the guy of all guys, the wizard of Washington is with us today. He has the answers for this country as well as for the ranking of the governors. My dear, dear friend, Ba, 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 Steve Moore. <laughs> Steve, it's all yours. Steve, you need all to right. get off mute. Oh, there Can you, you hear me now. All right. Yes. Fantastic. Well, first of all, how is it that, you know, uh, Arthur, that Arthur, you and I keep getting older and, and Donna doesn't get older. I don't, I don't really understand that. Um, good to be with you guys. And uh, by the way, Governor, you are maybe my favorite governor. It's between you. And Governor DeSantis in Florida is my favorite governor, and you've done an amazing job. And, and both of you have gotten A's on our report card. We love uh, Governor Reynolds in Iowa has done a fantastic job. Uh, we love what uh, what uh, Governor uh, has done in, in uh, Georgia. Kemp, he's been fantastic. Uh, so we're seeing some really, by the way, we did, Arthur, as you know, give one Democratic governor an A. Your good friend, you taught him well. Jared Polis of Colorado has done a fantastic job. Uh, and then on the other side of the spectrum, uh, you know, we have the sore thumbs and we have people like Governor Cuomo, who probably is the 
been the worst governor in America the, with the highest death rates. And you've seen uh, Governor Murphy of uh, New Jersey has, has been um, abysmal. Uh, my, I'm from Illinois, Arthur, as you know, J.B. Pritzker has been a pretty bad governor. And by the way, I hope you're getting some of those refugees, Governor, um, from Illinois into Nebraska because uh, because Illinois is becoming a disaster case. So uh, I hope people will continue. We keep continue to update this. So we've got we're we're looking over your shoulder, Governor, every day. Don't rest on your laurels. We're going to keep <laughs> make sure that you continue to promote good sound po fiscal policies. Uh, by the way, I, I have to say this. I am what, such a huge admirer of your father, uh, Joe Ricketts, who's one of the great entrepreneurs in American history. And Arthur and I, we've worked with Joe Ricketts on fiscal responsibility issues in Washington for, for 20 years. So please uh, give my best to, to Joe Ricketts, who's an amazing, amazing entrepreneur. Uh, okay, so quickly, I'm just going to go over for a few slides. Can we put those slides up um, in terms of... Uh, not, not that one. I want to go to the... Um, to the other stack of slides, if we could. So let's go to the next slide, please. So these are the report. I don't know if you can read that, but this just shows you which governors got A's and what, which governors got uh, B's and C's and D's and F's. Uh, the most recent thing is we had to downgrade uh, uh, Governor Newsom of uh, Florida uh, to a D because things are going on in the wrong direction in um, in, uh, in uh, California. This is not partisan, by the way. It is not partisan. We are looking at just the facts, uh, as Donna said, and that gives you an indication of how your uh, state is doing. And if you can't read that and you want to go over the whole report, it's on the uh, website of uh, a Committee to Unleash Prosperity on ALEC. So can you go to the next chart? Okay, this is important. This shows, I think a lot of our, a lot of governors are taking a lot of flack in the Southeast for the increase in coronavirus cases. But what you can see is that this is just comparing five or six of the biggest states in the country. And this is making the point I was making before. Look at New York and New Jersey, just catastrophic. Illinois has been a catastrophe. Uh, and so uh, I believe that these uh, governors like Ron DeSantis have done an amazing job. So is Governor Ducey in uh, Arizona, of course. Uh, Greg Abbott of Texas has done a, a really nice job. If you'll show the next chart, uh, this is something we should all be concerned about. It just shows you what's happening. What, you know, Governor, you talked about this, but this just shows you uh, how, uh, how much government spending has risen. So these are just the increases in spending uh, in terms of almost trillions of dollars from phase one to phase three, then we have phase three and a half, and now we're on phase four. And if you look at that bottom of that, if we do we cannot allow uh, Nancy Pelosi to spend another three trillion dollars, or we'll we'll have government spending uh, highest levels ever in American history. You can see that from the next chart, which just shows the massive increase in government. Uh, you know, through uh, when you add the state and local spending, you're talking about over ten trillion dollars of government spending this year, which is which is just outrageous. That show the next chart. Uh, you know, that's basically showing you the same thing. We could have a, a situation by the end of this year where government spending is 52% of our GDP. That has never happened before in the history of this country, even that, at the height of the uh, Great Depression and even at the height of uh, World War II, we never saw government spending take over our economy the way it has in this last year. We can't allow that to continue to happen. So the next chart. Uh, you can see this is government spending as share of GDP, and look what it's the way it's just shot up this year. I believe Arthur Laffer is right that this government spending is a negative for the economy, not a positive for the economy. It's an important lesson that Arthur Laffer has told us, and and Milton Friedman, by the way, that there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. All of that government spending is coming at the expense of the private sector, not as a supplement. Uh, next chart. Uh, this is just showing what's happening with respect to. Uh, the spending is a, a relative to other industries, but I'll move back. Uh, I'm moving on, running out of time, so I'll, we'll skip that. Can you just put up the next chart, please? Uh, government employment. This is kind of a scandal that, uh, you know, we've seen major uh, reductions in employment through the coronavirus of almost every industry except government. Government continues to grow and grow and grow. That's a problem. Next chart. Uh, that's making the same point. I'll skip that. Next chart. Uh, you can see that the, there's the losses. There have been some losses in jobs in, in the government sector, but the got, private sector has taken the, the vast majority of the hit in terms of unemployment. Uh, next chart. 
same thing, you know, got government workers, about half as likely to have been laid off as a private sector worker. Next chart. So this is really important, and maybe I'll end with this. Uh, it's, we're in a critical moment right now in terms of what's happening in Washington with this phase four negotiations, which are starting in earnest next week. We need everybody to weigh in on this. And one of the proposals that Art Laffer, Steve Forbes, Larry Kudlow, uh, Steve Moore, and most importantly, uh, Donald J. Trump are promoting is a payroll tax reduction to give every single American worker a seven and a half percent reduction in their payroll, in their uh, seven and a half percent increase in their paycheck starting on August 1st, uh, which, and by the way, every single small business employer in the United States would get a seven and a half percent reduction in their payroll costs. Uh, we believe this would be a major stimulus to the economy. So you can see that we estimate about 3 million additional jobs would be created before the end of the year by doing this. So it, it encourages employment and encourages hiring and encourages people to get back to jobs. Now, this is the really critical point. Uh, under the current law, we have a, a, a policy that is paying more than four out of five workers more money for staying unemployed than going back on the job. This is a major, major problem with the American economy today. We have 25 million Americans unemployed because of the shutdown, but the, the problem that every single business that we're talking to is saying is we can't get our workers back on the job. We estimate that if the Pelosi plan takes effect and we extend that policy of these super unemployment benefits of $600 a week, for another six months, and by the way, that's in the Pelosi bill, that would reduce employment in the United States through the end of the year by 10 million. 10 million jobs would be lost that would otherwise be created. Uh, that, that is a catastrophe. We cannot allow that to happen. Uh, the difference between our plan, which is to create 3 million jobs, and their plan, which is to destroy 10 million, they add, the math is very easy here, that's 13 million job swing, uh, that's a lot of jobs. And to give you a sense of how many jobs that is, that's more than the entire employment in the states of Ohio, Michigan, and Indiana combined. So we need pro-growth policies that encourage people to work, that encourage people to get back on the job and earning paychecks. And we need people less dependent on government. And that's why this is a critical moment for our country. And Arthur, I will turn it back to you. First, if I can, just be clapping, Steve. That's a wonderful, wonderful job. I don't know why they don't understand it in Washington, but if you tax people who work and you pay people who don't work, don't be surprised if you find a lot of people not working. Uh, you and Donna did a great job. Let me just say we're working on the governor's rankings. We should get a first or good first draft. Lisa, this will be an ALEC product, product. We should get a first draft in probably the next month or so of getting it for everything right wrapped up together to get the rankings. And then hopefully we can take that project and run it into other areas like House members, Senate members, and other officials. So that's where our objectives are here. And if I can, Pete, if I can ask you to start off with the first question to Donna or to Steve and what your thoughts are. So when you're looking at this, what do you think are the things that the federal government has done that's been effective throughout this pandemic, one of the things that you think that you look at and say, okay, that was the wrong direction to go. Donna, do you want to start or do you want Steve? Uh, federal government, why don't Steve take it? So, uh, Governor, I think the biggest mistake, but you're asking what's the biggest mistake that we've made? Oh, the biggest good thing. Well, the biggest bad thing. thing. What, well, well, compare and contrast. contrast. You mean uh, at the federal level? Yeah. Yeah. At the federal level. Well, you know, Arthur and I and Steve Forbes came out, and Arthur, you should weigh in on this. We, we supported the idea of a loan program for businesses that were negatively affected by the virus. And, uh, and I think that that was a good idea. I think there was some abuses in the program, Governor, and I think if we had to do it over again, we might have done it slightly differently. But that program, I think, has worked you know, fairly well in terms of letting our small businesses survive. So that I think was a good program. The unemployment insurance, we should have never, never, never allowed Pelosi to carry the day on this unemployment insurance. I, I'm sure that you have the same problem in Nebraska that I was talking about. This is the strangest situation I've ever seen in my 35 years of studying this stuff. We have 25 million unemployed Americans today, Governor, across America. And yet everywhere you go, all you see is help wanted signs today. 
Why is that? Yeah. Because yeah. employers will not hire their workers. I mean, um, workers will not go back to their old job. And we have to make the fairness issue here. How is it fair that these heroic workers who've been working the full time throughout this pandemic, the first responders, the nurses, the doctors, the people are collecting our garbage and delivering our food and delivering packages. All of those people are the heroes of the American economy. How is it fair they're getting paid less money than the people are sitting at home? I mean, you can't make up bad ideas like this, Arthur. Yeah, let me get yeah, in if I can. What, what you're saying, and it's Walter Badgett, who was the publisher of the London Economist in the 19th century. He had the old phrase, in times of crisis, discount freely. And the Fed did that very, very well, Pete. So did the Treasury. They stepped in and made loans to, to, to keep uh, illiquid but solvent companies from going bankrupt. That's what they did, and they did a darn good job. I think they also did a darn good job in the CARES Act for medical spending. I don't think there's ever been a time in U.S. history and world history where you've seen such an advancement of science in one area so quickly. I mean, what is it? We've got 25 uh, vaccines now on the label, ready to go. I mean, this is the most incredible period of that. But what Steve says is completely right as well. Uh, there's, this is not the time to bail out bad dealers, whether they're companies or people who aren't working. You know, transfer payments, government spending is taxation. Whenever the government spends money, it takes it from someone else and gives it to someone. Government doesn't create resources, government redistributes resources. And we've got to remember that. And Steve, your point of over 50% of GDP is right. Donna, do you want to add anything? Well, just to mimic that, when you said don't be, you know, fairness and don't be bailing out um, companies, don't do the same thing with students. And Steve and Arthur, you talked about that and, and perhaps the governor, but having this, you know, next round of stimulus be available to bail out states is also going to be a terrible economic policy. Pete, does and, that and, it's unfair. <laughs> And, and Steve, to your point, uh, here in Nebraska, we actually passed a law a couple of years ago that said, if you're unemployed or if you've been laid off and your employer calls you back to work, or if uh, you're offered a job and you don't take it, then you lose your unemployment benefits. So that's helped mitigate that $600 a week thing here because, um, you know, again, we tell employers, hey, if you offer somebody a job and they don't take it, you let us know, we'll cut it, they lose their benefits. And so that's so it mitigates some of that distance. Senate, but I'll tell you, even with that law here in Nebraska, I still hear just about every day from employers that people don't call back. They're, they're, they've told, some have just been so bold. In fact, we had a guy, we offered a job to in our Department of Labor, and he out and out told us, yeah, I can make more money staying at home, so I'm just going to stay at home. Now, needless to say, that guy didn't get to keep his benefits because he told the Department of Labor, but it's still a misconception out there, even in Nebraska, that you can just stay home and not look for work. Uh, in fact, actually, one of the things I did at the beginning of the pandemic is I waived the work search requirement. I just reinstated it so that people would have to start looking for work if they're on employment, anticipating that hopefully the $600 a week thing goes away at the end of uh, July. You don't give IQ tests, do you, to the people you offer jobs to? Can you imagine that person actually saying that to the Department of Labor? I'm sorry, Pete, that's just a riot. Tim, do you want to open it for questions from the outside? Yeah, Dr. Laffer, we've got some uh, questions from the audience. It's been a fascinating discussion and uh, couldn't think of better people to have it with. So, Governor, how about I throw this to you first, then we can go around the horn. Um, we've heard about a lot of things that we, we don't want the government to do, especially the federal government. Uh, Governor Ricketts, what, what, would you, what would your advice be to the other 49 governors of how they can get their states and their workers back to work as we continue to reopen the economy? Well, you know, every state's going to be different. So obviously people are going to have to tailor their responses. And that's the beauty of our system of federalism. I'm a big states rights guy. And really what was said at the beginning where this should be locally managed, state directed, and then federally supported is the way we should be approaching this. I think state governments, other governors should be taking a look at, look, I may have a big urban area where I've got difficulties controlling the virus, but I probably got lots of rural parts of the state that don't have that same problem. And so tailoring your response to the different parts of your state is one of the things I encourage all governors to take a look at. You may not have to have the same rules in a big urban area that you have in your rural parts of the state. And that at least starts allowing you to have more flexibility in those parts of the state to let people get back to a more normal life. Then the other thing I would say is don't mandate. Look, here's the problem with mandates. Just think about managing this long-term. If you mandate something, 
now, like say you mandate masks, and then you unmandate it, you've got to take it off at some point, then people just stop doing it. Whereas if we have to think about managing this for the long term, what we need to think about is, well, when is the appropriate time I you wear a mask? You know, if I'm going to go to the store, that's probably a good time. If I'm outside at a barbecue with a bunch of my friends and we're trying to stay six feet apart, yeah, I don't, probably don't need to wear a mask. So, and then do you really want your cops writing tickets for people who are wearing masks or not wearing masks in public? I mean, don't they have something better to do? Uh, I, I can tell you, cops don't want to write tickets for that. So I would say, try, take a light hand with the government. Don't mandate stuff. Ask people to do the right thing. And I found my experience in Nebraska is when you ask people to do the right thing, they generally do it. Pete, in the olden days, they the cops used to arrest people that wore masks at night and stuff. Right? And now we're <laughs> it's a different world, isn't it? Tim, uh, excuse me, Donna, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, not to that, Arthur. <laughs> I love you guys, by the way, so much. I can't enjoy life more than I do with you. Lisa, where are you that we need you on this call, too? <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, Steve, do you have a comment? The room may be full. I don't know. Hey, Steve, let me okay. ask you a question. I'll throw, I'll throw this one to you first, Steve, because uh, you, you've been talking about it quite a bit, uh, about this, this idea of this federal bailout of states. What, what would happen? What would be the negative consequences of that? Why should, why should the federal government not propose it? Why should the states not accept it? Steve, mute, 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 Steve. Oh, is, is that, is that, I was interested in what the governor had to say about that, but I'll just quickly say, you know, look at the numbers. Uh, and Donna, I've gotten a lot of these numbers from you, but how in the world is it fair? Let's just take my favorite contrast, uh, Florida uh, versus uh, New York. And I think you worked in both those states, Donna, but Florida and New York have roughly the same population. I think Florida's surpassed uh, New York, but but not by much. So they're a good experiment. They're both about the same size, about 20 million people. Uh, New York spends twice, almost twice as much per person on state and local government as Florida does. Twice as much, Governor. I mean, where does all that money go? How do they keep? And by the way, you've worked in both states, uh, you know, Donna. I've I've spent a lot of time in both those states. I would venture to say that the public services are better in Florida at half the cost than they are in New York. So why in the world would we be bailing out? Why should we require people in Nebraska that is a fiscally sound state to have to pay more federal taxes to, to bail out you know, New York or New Jersey? My home state of Illinois, as you know, Governor, has pension benefits, I mean, pension liabilities that are Huge. Gargantuan. Huge. I mean, yeah, they are. It is almost criminally negligent how uh, how much those unfunded liabilities are. I don't think many people in Nebraska want to play pay for Illinois' pension system. Not at all. And, uh, and that goes to the fairness issue. But there's also you really don't want to bring that on yourself. I mean, I worked in the, with the governor of Florida after 9/11, and stimulus money started coming down. We knew the worst thing we could do was spend that on an ongoing basis because you're just pushing the problems off into the future. Um, the governor at that time immediately called the legislature back in session to cut the budget, even though we were also working on, you know, develop, redeveloping our economy. So uh, you just giving a state a reason to push the, kick the can down the road and it's not gonna end well. Tim. Donna, uh, following up with you, uh, as, you're, as, as you and the others are working on putting together the, uh, the governor's report, uh, me what message would you give to all these legislators who are tuned in right now, all these state leaders who are watching us as they, as they well, I guess they're not going back to their states, right? They're, we're all in our states. But some of us are going, like Missouri is going to have a special session next week. Other states will probably have special sessions this year. Some states are still in session. What can they tell the governors, the staffs in the governor's offices? What should they uh, be doing so their governors get better grades in the report that's coming out? Well, first of all, great question. And, you know, we know that not all governors have the same makeup of their legislature. So those of them that have majorities or super majorities of ALEC members are always going to succeed. Um, but, um, and by the way, what, as we're working on this report card, please be in contact with us to let us know if there's some things we're missing in your state. But to help them along, absolutely. You know, again, like I said, not popular. 
go in and cut your budget so that you can move on, you know, get this problem behind you. At the same time, do those things that Governor Ricketts talked about, which is, you know, stop subsidizing people not to work. Um, find ways to incentivize businesses to get people employed and get the economy moving. Um, if you have to use reserves, you know, make sure that you use them for a short-term retooling of your economy and don't spend them all down because you're going to need them. Um, finally, you know, again, don't ask for the federal bailout. Tim, can I ask you a question? Weren't you the le House leader in Missouri when you guys cut the tax by 10 percent and that was with Nixon and then he vetoed it, then you overrode us? That's yes. what you should be doing, overriding your governors if they veto your tax cut. And if they don't, they didn't tax cut enough. Make it so they have to veto it so you can override them and get that economic growth coming back. Do the Tim Jones model of economic growth. How's that, Tim? Yeah, and Dr. Laffer, you bring, for you. Yeah, Dr. Laffer, you bring up a great point. I mean, uh, don't let a good crisis go to waste, right? Like uh, yes, Rahm Emanuel, thank you. I That's what's said. true, and it's a great crisis. And we and Steve is, wants to get rid of the payroll tax. How better to take advantage of this crisis than to have a payroll tax holiday for the rest of the year? I mean, there you've used the crisis to create pro growth policies. That's what we need desperately. And what you did in Missouri was just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. 